This video is applicable to all users of all databases, and it looks at the importance of serializability in a database and the select for update pattern. If you're using a database with serializable isolation, this won't be a problem for you. The database will manage concurrency of transactions so that you don't run into issues like the acid rain attack, which was outlined in a fantastic white paper from Todd Vashavsky and Peter Bayliss. And what it allows you to do, let's assume you've got a bank account with a balance of $1,000. If you run multiple concurrent requests at the same time against that database, one to check the balance, make sure you've got enough to withdraw and then withdraw it, the first number of requests that hit the database will all read 1,000 and be able to withdraw up to 1,000 of that. So if you've got 100 threads running against a database with a balance of 1,000, without that protection in place, you could potentially be withdrawing $100,000 instead of the maximum $1,000. In today's demo, I'm going to show you CockroachDB and Postgres. Postgres will start with an isolation level of read committed, which is vulnerable to this. Then I'll change Postgres's isolation level to serializable and do the same for Cockroach. So these are the steps that I'm going to be running. For the Postgres example, I'll run in read committed and serializable. I'll start with a balance of 1000 for one account and I'll attempt to withdraw $999. In a read committed database, there could be one or more transactions that successfully managed to do this. They'll read $1,000 and they'll write 999, i.e. withdraw 999. It might be that n number of transactions fails, but the important thing to note here is that more than one transaction can succeed. Now in a serializable database, that's not possible. Each transaction will be run in serial and therefore only the $999 from one transaction can ever succeed. Let's take a look at the code. First, I read in a connection string from the environment and fail if I don't get one. I allow the caller of the application to tweak a couple of parameters. So the number of workers to run concurrently, i.e. number of threads to run in this acid rain attack. It defaults to one, but I will be ramping it up and the pool size, the number of connections to hold open to the database. This will also affect the number of concurrent writes that we're able to make against the database. I pass a connection string, I set the max connections, I connect to the database, I ping it just to make sure I've got a connection, and then I start a timer that ticks every second. After every second, I attempt to withdraw as much as I possibly can using the acid rain attack, and then I reset the account back to its previous state of $1,000. In the acid rain attack, I spin up n number of workers denoted by the concurrency that I received from the input arg, and I create a transaction. I read the balance, and if the balance is greater than or equal to the amount I want to withdraw, the $999, I attempt to write the new balance, which essentially performs a withdrawal, and I increment the number of withdrawals, and I tally up the total withdrawal amount. If I fail, I increment a counter rather than bubbling up and crashing the application, and then I wait for everything to finish. At the end, I report on how many withdrawals I was able to make and the number of failed withdrawals. And then I return the total withdrawn from the account and print it out. There are two other functions. There's a read balance. So I select the balance from the account where the ID is equal to a canned ID that I've already populated. And initially, I'm going to run without the for update. And what the for update does is in a select like this, it will lock any rows that match the predicate. So it will lock the account where the ID is equal to this because an update is going to happen later on. It basically ensures that everything happens in the right order. I read out the balance and I return it. Then I write the balance. So I update the account. I set the balance to be equal to the balance minus the amount that I withdrew where the ID is equal to this. And it's all run within a transaction. And finally, I just reset the account balance to be a thousand. So I can just run the same thing over and over and over. First, I'll set up a connection to Postgres and I'll open up a terminal to it and create an account table, a UUID primary key ID, and an integer balance. Then I insert the canned ID that I mentioned in the code and a balance of 1000. The default isolation level in Postgres is recommitted and that can be seen from a call to show transaction isolation level. And now we're ready to get going. So first I'll run an application with one concurrent writer. Now this is important because it will mask the fact that there is a problem. And this is mentioned in the white paper. If there's low concurrency that can mask concurrency issues in your database. My pool size will be 10, although that won't be affected because I'll just be using one connection and I'll start that going. So we performed one withdrawal and nothing failed. Every time we reset the balance and we're only able to withdraw $999. I'll stop that and then I'll do the same thing, but this time with 10 concurrent workers. So 
So this time, with re the recommitted isolation level, we're able to perform up to 10 withdrawals. So the number of workers that I have and the pool size of 10 allows us to perform 10 operations at exactly the same time. And instead of withdrawing the $999 that I have in the account, I'm able to withdraw 10 times that at $9,990. This problem will only get worse the higher the concurrency. So this is the acid rain attack in action. Let's update it to 20 workers with a pool size of 20. And this time we'll withdraw $19,980. So it, the problem just gets worse and worse as the concurrency goes up. Now let's update Postgres to be serializable. You can tweak the isolation levels in Postgres. If you need to protect yourself against this attack, I would recommend running in serializable isolation mode. If you run this straight away, you'll still see read committed. You need to come out of the terminal and go back into it for your changes to be apparent. But anything that's connected to the database outside of the terminal will be fine. So let's run that again. Let's keep it at 2020. And what we're seeing now is we're only able to perform one withdrawal of $999 and the other requests are failing. And that's because the way Postgres works, it will try to perform an update against a given row version. So let's say version one of the table has a balance of a thousand. I make my withdrawal, it goes down to one and it increments the row version such that any threads that are waiting on the update, they'll be trying to say implicitly, update this value where the row version is equal to one because that's the version I'm trying to update. Now, because the row version has been incremented, the version no longer matches and therefore the request fails. This is quite normal for any serializable isolation database. You will have to be aware of transaction failures and retry them as necessary. What I'll do here is I'll highlight a difference between Cockroach and Postgres now. If I run this again, but this time with the full update, what we'll see is in Postgres, we're still getting those failures. It's still trying to update against that known row version, which has by that point changed. So the request still fails. Let's move on to Cockroach. I'll create a single node cluster and connect to the shell. And now that I'm connected, I will create the same account table with a balance into which I'll insert exactly the same data. And if I show you the isolation level for Cockroach, you'll see that the default is serializable. As before, I'll run a single concurrent worker a low concurrency example with a pool size of 10. And what we see is one withdrawal of $99 with zero failures, as expected. Now let's up the concurrency level to 10. And this time what we see in Cockroach is there are zero failures. The request was forced to wait. And then by the time we came in to the read, we were guaranteed to get the latest version of the data. So when we read the account balance for the second thread, we saw that the balance was one instead of a thousand, and we didn't try to do anything else. We already knew that we couldn't withdraw any additional funds. Let's ramp this up again. So 20 concurrent workers with a pool size of 20. And this is gonna to continue to scale with Cockroach. Obviously the amount of contention is going up because every one of these threads is trying to update the same row, but CockroachDB is protecting us every time. To summarize, ignoring isolation levels in databases is no joke. Serializable isolation is the way to go if you need to guarantee what you're reading from your database and writing to your database is always going to be consistent. I've demonstrated that in a read committed database, not only can you get inconsistent data, you can also exploit this and trick the database. And in the white paper, they mentioned this isn't just a theoretical attack. It's been run in the wild and it's bankrupt a Bitcoin exchange. The attackers were able to withdraw more funds than the Bitcoin exchange had available to it. And the Bitcoin exchange went out of business. And this could be you if you're not using a serializable isolation database with transactions, knowing in which order your transactions are executed in, you potentially open yourself up to attacks just like this. In this example, I'm using a read, then a write within a transaction. If I wasn't doing that, each transaction would be executed in isolation as an implicit transaction. Ergo, even if you're using a serializable isolation database, you can still fall victim to this because if you're executing reads and writes outside of a transaction, there's no guarantee as to when those things are going to execute and what value they're going to return.